with God as our Father, children all are we. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Friends, good morning. Grace to you and peace. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to our digital worship here at Bethel First Presbyterian Church. And as this uh, COVID shutdown continues, we await a decision this Wednesday from our session on how we will continue uh, for the rest of the month of June and beyond, uh, hopefully with the best information we have to keep everyone safe as we continue to pray for um, this shutdown and the challenges it, it creates for our togetherness. With that said, I, I turned my attention this morning to say this. Relationships are difficult. Relationships all require communication. You don't just get married and never speak to your spouse and expect to be together to celebrate your golden anniversary 50 years later. In my family, like most families, conflicts arise on a regular basis. There are disagreements about this, that, and the other that are common to parents, spouses, and children. But in my family, we also come to the table, and at that table, we share meals. And around that table, we talk. The conversations we have are necessary for our family, for our relationships together. And we talk about our common ground. We talk about things that are essential to our family life. And often these conversations at that table pave the way to restorative conversations about our squabbles and disagreements as well. Race relations are no different. And friends, our nation is in sore need of coming to that common table and engaging in some very direct and unifying conversations about our family, the American people, all of the American people. In this conversation, our brothers and sisters of color need to be heard, and the family must resolve to seek healing, to seek reconciliation, to seek to make this a better place for everyone. The thoughts I share today are my attempt, a feeble attempt, to foster and support that conversation here at Bethel First, in our community in Campbellsville and beyond. With that said, I would like to begin with this story from the year 1956, from the city of Montgomery, Alabama. It was there and then that the 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. became the Montgomery bus boycott leader. It was not exactly a post or position that people were lining up for. Difficult times difficult circumstances. And on January 27th of that year, King received a phone call. And the voice on the other end of the line, because phones then really had lines, the, the voice on the other side was speaking a very threatening message. And he was telling them that if he and his family did not leave town within three days, they would all be dead. King reported being paralyzed by fear, as I think we all can imagine. How would he get his family out of town? And he sat at his kitchen table very late at night and had a conversation with God. He put his hands, his, his head in his hands and prayed and he cried. And he says then he heard a voice. And it was a assuring and calming inner voice. The voice told him to stand up, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth. The voice promised to be with him to the ends of the earth. The voice promised to never leave him alone. King had experienced an encounter with God, and by that encounter, his fear was removed. He went from fear of a dangerous situation to a world where he believed in Emmanuel, God with us. And two nights later, King's house was bombed while he was away at a meeting. His family, his wife and daughter, were okay. And he went home to find an angry mob of his supporters ready to exact revenge and to begin a riot because of that, because of that attack. King got up on his porch, which was still burning. And from that still burning porch, he said to the crowd, Those who live by the sword die by the sword. We have to love our enemies. 
Be good to them. Do what is right and just, and God will be with us. The crowd dropped their weapons. They joined hands on the spot, and there together sang Amazing Grace. Can you picture the scene? Can you imagine that with me? Together in this moment, those voices unified, singing, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. How powerful a moment was that? How transformative a moment was that? To some historians, this moment is seen as the turning point in the civil rights movement, where love of the enemy became the practice. The preacher I heard share this story, Sky Jet Thani, adds his perspective to these events, saying that I think that the turning point was really three nights earlier. King's vision was transformed by his encounter with God, an encounter that took away his fear. Friends, the church needs that moment again. Our nation needs that moment again. The world needs that moment again. We need that kind of confidence and certainty about God's ultimate love for us and our ability to trust in that love. How do you get it? Where do you turn for that kind of assurance and comfort? The minister that I just mentioned, Sky Jethani, has written a book entitled Singing at Midnight. And he offers in that book what I think serves as a logical answer. This is a book that is a devotion type book, a book of daily readings that follows Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross and to the grave and on to glory. It begins one of those daily readings focused on responding to evil by turning to the account of Jesus' arrest in the Gospel of Matthew. In Scripture, that account reads this way. While he, Jesus, was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward. The men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put out at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, I am leading a rebellion that you have come out with, or am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts of teaching. You did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. In the book I mentioned, the daily reading and the author of it, the author recalls that when Judas arrived with the soldiers, Jesus' disciples were terrified. Peter, that servant, couldn't decide what to do. He started with the response of trying to fight. He reached for a sword, but Peter was not a trained soldier. By, by, by trade, he was what? He was a fisherman. And all he was able to do was cut off one of the enemy's ears. And when he realized that fighting would not work, Peter... And the other disciples did what? They, they fled the scene. Now, you and I know that when the human body is placed in a highly anxious situation, we revert to a primal reptilian response that we call fight or flight. 
Biologically speaking, it's a survival instinct. It's a response that we see Peter display in this gospel account. Only he took the or out of the equation and changed it to an and. He displayed both fight and flight. In batting average terms, Peter was batting 2,000. And he and the other disciples deserted their Savior and went off into hiding, Scripture tells us. This response couldn't have been any more different than Jesus' response. Peter's response was a response of fear. Jesus' response was a response of faith, deep faith. Peter acted with aggression. Jesus acted with compassion. Jesus even picked up the servant's ear and healed him. This response begs us to ask the question, why did Jesus respond so differently amid so much danger? And how did he have the capacity to love his enemy rather than to fight or flee, or fight and flee? The answer is that Jesus isn't restricted to simply those two options. He offers us another possibility, a third option. When we are threatened, when the world appears to be a dangerous place and fearful place, we can also choose to respond not by fleeing, not by fighting, but by faith. We can believe that God is still Emmanuel, God with us in this world in which not even death can separate us from his love. Armed not with weapons, but with this knowledge, we can surrender our fear. We can release our anger and we can find the power to love even those who seek our harm. We can find strength to join in seeing in the face of the threat of evil. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Once lost, now found. That is transformative, friends. That is narrative changing. That is world changing truth. And right now, our world needs that kind of world changing truth. And we need to be a part of it. As I conclude my thoughts, I ask you to join me by bowing your hearts and heads and allowing my words to become your words in this prayer together. Holy God, we call upon your name. As George Floyd's needless death has brought about this sense in our nation of urgency to be repairers of a breach in race relations. We turn to you for direction, for wisdom, for strength, and for grace. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. God, convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Strengthen me with assurance that there is nothing that can separate me from your love. And with this assurance, may I be bold in the face of danger. May I remember the actions of your son as well as I remember his prayer that was taught to say to you, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, may the song Anne plays for our closing serve as our charge to humble ourselves, that our hearts might be changed, to be the hearts of God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may we go now to be the body of Christ to a world in need. Amen and amen.